Thank you. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. This is the official welcome to the morning session. The workshop. The workshop has proven quite popular over the past few years to give us some practical, concrete insight into implementing TRIP strategies and TRIP procedures. So we're very happy to see you here this morning. And I'd like to introduce Alexandra next to me here. She'll be operating all of the equipment this morning. So if you have any technical questions as a presenter, as you come up, Alexandra will take very good care of you. I'd like to thank SIGPA for the reception last night. And those of you who were here probably very much enjoyed the networking and the exceptional music that was offered to us. It, it, wasn't it great, uh, different? electronic harp and everyone I saw was moving quite a bit. So again, Sikpa, thank you very much. And I'm told that this evening it is as spectacular, so make sure you get to the reception this evening. I'd like to say that uh, the compendium, which is still on some desks, we have additional copies at the back on the table, so if you want to take another one home, for your colleagues, please do so. And we have the new Trip magazine just out today. Actually, the printers were bringing it up 
at the back of the room. So again, take your copies of the Trip magazine. We have a slight change in order uh, for the presentations this morning. The first one will be moved closer to the noon lunch break, and we'll, we'll begin with uh, the ICAO Technical Cooperation Bureau in just a few moments. I'd like to indicate very briefly how we will proceed this morning. We will have one presentation after the other. Each presentation lasts about 15 minutes, and in the intervening one or two minutes, we will reset the next presentation. So again, thank you for your patience as we do the technical changeover from one presentation to the other as we move through the program. So first presentation this morning is on the ICAO Technical Cooperation Bureau. It will be presented by Mr. Guillermo Iovo. Iovino, Iovino. See, I'm practicing my Italian, Guillermo. Iovino, voila. A few words on Guillermo. He has worked on numerous international, regional, and national projects, both with ICAO, governments, industry, and IATA, in addition to the Inter-American Development Bank. And his role there was primarily as a senior coordinator for multilateral programs. After years in that field, where he held various positions, such as aircraft design and maintenance engineer, government inspector, international advisor, and USOP auditor in more than 40 countries, Guillermo currently leads the project development unit of the field operations section at ICAO's Technical Cooperation Bureau. So Guillermo, we may ask you to sing in Italian a bit later, but for now, maybe your presentation. So, Guillermo, the floor is yours. Well, what the presentation, huh? We'll let the singing for later, for the shower, probably. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, Guillermo Jovino again. I'm representing the Technical Cooperation Bureau in ICAO is one of the five bureaus that deals with the different uh, standards and recommended practices. And in particular, we work with field uh, projects to assist your states in implementing everything you are talking during these symposiums. So the idea through the field operations section is to, again, support you, states and organizations, in going ahead, in this case, with the TRIP strategy. So we'll go quite fast because of the time constraints. Um, this one is good. So based on the IKEA Assembly Resolution last year, who reaffirmed the role of TCB, of this bureau in being a key element, key tool for you to implement projects, right, for the development and support of states in the implementation of these projects. We work as a difference from this symposium on the five strategic objectives of ICAO for those of you who are not familiar, that are safety, capacity and efficiency, security and facilitation, economic development, and environmental protection. So we'll go through some of the projects during this presentation, and as a brief introduction of who we are, uh, some credentials. Uh, we manage annually a program implementation of about 110 million average uh, of projects all around the world. Currently we have, a, well, by 2016, now we have a few more, 110 average, again, projects per year on the whole range of uh, ICAO activities. We are working with about 140 countries. This ranges between 110, 150 countries per year. And in this case, for 2016, 10 organizations, international organizations or private organizations. 
uh, some achievements and the areas in which we assist that goes a bit beyond this symposium, but it's good for you to know since we have here civil aviation authorities, ministries, ministries of transport, and different entities. We work in uh, safety. We provide support in safety oversight, uh, review of legislation, development of civil aviation laws, regulations, and procedures, master plans, civil aviation master plans, which in fact contain uh, national air transport facilitation plans and other plans, as well as other plans, state safety programs, uh, air navigation programs. Uh, we help in support the organization with staffing people in the states, restructuring, uh, restructuring of uh, organizations, capacity development for aerodrome certification, airline certification, air operators, maintenance organizations, capacity development of, uh, sorry, civil aviation master plans, compliance with the uh, ICAO SARPs. In the air navigation and capacity and efficiency strategic objective, we help on development of civil aviation authorities, capacity building for air navigation service providers, uh, airport operators. We work also on developing countries training programs, uh, helping the service providers to implement their safety management systems. In the area of security and facilitation, preparation uh, to follow up on different audits, development of corrective action plans for the states, TRIP, MRTD, e-passport strategies, implementation of that. We are going to go through a few projects to see some difference and some commonalities on them. Uh, economic development of air transport, infrastructure for aerodromes, forecasts, different analysis, procurement services for ANR system, uh, air navigation systems, security systems, and in the area of environmental protection, we uh, help in supporting the audits, action plans, and different development plans. So regarding the TRIP strategy, that is what brings you here today. The idea of the strategy, as you well know, is to contribute to the capacity of member states to identify and then properly confirm the identity of travelers. For that simple mission, we have states struggle through different situations that requires, in many cases, our support. So we're going to go through some examples of assistance, in this case through a bit less than 10 uh, states and some United Nations uh, organizations in which we were providing support. But we are open, after all, to discuss with you any help or any support that we can provide to you. Uh, at the end, we are going to see a bit briefly uh, how we support you through different mechanisms, mainly three mechanisms that we'll see. So how specifically we assist states in implementing this strategy? We provide analysis of existing processes and systems, uh, identity management systems and the civil registry, emission of passports, including the current control and protection of the inputs, travel document issue and authority organizational structure, as you can see, the different key elements of the TRIP strategy. Conformance to ICAO DOC 9303 on the e-passport booklet. Identification of current capacity gaps and challenges for the implementation of TRIP elements. Assessment of border management, control and inspection tools. So you, we help you with experts to um, ensure that your systems are in place, and provision of recommended roadmap for the implementation of MRTDs and membership to the PKD. Um, 
through some consultancy services at various steps of the procurement of MRTDs, uh, we can support you in the development of technical specifications for tenders through our procurement uh, department, the, our procurement section, evaluation of bidders' proposals, opening of the, bidder, of the biddings, uh, managing the tenders with um, you as the state always together. Sometimes the, the tenders are done by you directly. Sometimes we can support you to do it through the IKEA system. Assistance during uh, factory acceptance tests, site acceptance tests, capacity building training, turnkey solutions for the implementation of, of MRTD and inspection systems and tools through IKEA's procurement services. So some examples, as we said, uh, different projects that we have had during the last uh, few years. Tendering of an e-passport system, the complete e-passport system. Assessment of a new e-passport booklet. Assistance in the implementation of an e-passport. Assistance to the Ministry of Immigration. We work with different authorities, different ministries, depending on the setup in your country. Uh, auditing of the passport issue system and implementation of uh, biometric e-passports, implementation of e-boarding and e-passport systems, implementation of the trip. As you can see, these come from different titles, from different projects. The projects are similar in nature, but the range is completely different. We can go from a few thousand dollar projects for a couple of weeks assessment there to um, years of projects in the field as establishing, for example, the complete e-passport system in, in different countries. So going through, again, some titles here. Uh, we have been working with uh, different states, the ones who come to my mind, Antigua, Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, um, Rwanda, um, Lebanon, etc. Um, the difference, as I said, is that we have to set up and to scope the project to your needs. So we work with you in uh, doing that. Um, the project goal in this case was to assist in the tendering of a funding passport system for the state. Uh, we provided technical assistance in procurement of the system. In other case, uh, assessment of uh, the booklet, a state that had already the passport done and they wanted to be sure that the booklet was in conformance with 9303. So after they had their own um, service provider and all the system established, they wanted to ensure that all the specifications in 9303 were in conformance uh, were, were transmitted to the, to the booklet itself. Uh, assistance in the implementation of another passport to provide consultancy services for assessment of stakeholder requirements, development of technical specifications for tender formulation, assistance in the evaluation of proposals, monitoring of project implementation, and final system access, acceptance. So after this, in this case, it was a thorough uh, report given to the state based on which we worked on further steps to solve the issues that the state had there. So assistance to a Ministry of Immigration in another state uh, to provide full-scale assessment and consulta technical consultation and upgrading to a passport issue system from the previous system they have there. Up, uh, upgrading to an e-residence permit card issue system. As you can see, we go now to, okay, good. We went uh, through different areas of the key element one in this case, other documents. So we'll go a bit faster. So establishing of um, fingerprint identification system and uh, facial recogn recognition systems. Different examples of projects here. E-border, 
modern trip. So, what is the added value that we offer for you from ICAO? Um, we can help you to identify what you need to establish a gap analysis on where you should work to properly implement your system, to comply with ICAO SARPs, to be in line with the regional frameworks, in, if any. Uh, we can help you developing your human resources through training, fellowships, etc. We can procure goods and services for you. We can tender for companies to provide you the service, or we can provide the services through our experts. And we can provide project manager, uh, project management for you. So the benefits of uh, partnering with us is that uh, we are a UN agency. We have uh, no commercial purpose. We work just on a course recovery basis. We have been working for the last 60, actually 65 years with ICAO in almost every single country in the world. We have a roster of about 3,000 experts. Uh, we are a worldwide recognized and high quality training. We are ISO 9001. We have many internal controls that can provide you transparency and purchasing um, impartiality and objectivity when you select your uh, providers. So the idea on uh, what we do and what we offer for you, what is here for you, is you can pass by our booth and to discuss whatever needs you have. This is a mechanism that ICAO has specifically to support you states in implementing your needs. So thank you very much. This is an overview of uh, the project that we are currently working on throughout the world. So again, thank you very much for your time and uh, you are invited to pass through our booth to have uh, any discussion that you may think is necessary. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Guillermo, for giving us an outline of the many services and the support, overall support that ICAO can bring to the implementation of the TRIP strategy. Thank you again. We'll take just a few moments to switch the presentations and we'll be right back. Thank you. Idemia or Idemia, depending on whether you pronounce it in French or in English. So, Idemia. Our presenter is Christophe Rapin. He is head of borders at Idemia. He has a specialization in API and PNR data management systems. Prior to this, he was sales director of the API PNR business line while signing contracts with multiple governments, including France, Estonia, in Argentina. He has also worked alongside the French Ministry of the Interior and French airports to anticipate and support the changes of identity systems. Before joining IDEMIA, Christophe worked for 10 years as sales manager in the public sector in France on behalf of integrators Logica and Sopra Group. So, Christophe, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. Please. Okay. 
So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming so early this morning and attending this first presentation of day two. Uh, here, so I'm very proud to present you uh, what we call maybe coming from dream to reality or from a concept to real operations. What will be live in uh, Singapore within less than a week uh, with the grand opening of the Terminal 4 at Changi Airport and our modest contribution as IDEMIA in the process of passengers in this new terminal. So um, I will describe you how, why, and uh, uh, what will be uh, the next steps of this uh, breakthrough as we describe it to the passenger facilitation processing of passengers arriving and departing from this terminal. Before a few figures, because IDEMIA, and IDEMIA in French, is maybe new to you, probably, because the brand is only one month, but we, uh, IDEMIA comes from the merging of Obertu Technologies and uh, Safran Identity and Security, two French companies, and you have here the main uh, figures of uh, the firm. Um, we are the leader in identity management, working for both governments, um, uh, criminal justice departments, but also uh, the private sector for financial institutions and mobile operators. The four uh, messages or the pillars of this new company can be summarized or described in this uh, scheme, which are the merge or the um, uh, complementarity of what we call the security, the core of our activity, the convenience, because there is the passenger or there is a citizen in the middle of all these processes and uh, technologies that we put into practice. The human factor, human factor for the end users, human factor for the uh, contributors, human factor for the technology providers. So how do we put all this together? And last but not least, the continuity. Continuity meaning we are able to provide end-to-end -end processes, but we can provide also a part or a subsystem for a global solution, but we need to be interoperable, we need to be uh, able to exchange and share information between all these stakeholders that are listed on the left side, either private or public in the public sector. So I try to be very short on the corporate presentation and to go directly to what should be of interest to, to most of you. So, what is the background of the program and what we've been delivering in, uh, in Singapore? Uh, the trend regarding border control and uh, passenger facilitation, now even in the company there is a, a huge dispute between the terminology. Do we talk about still border control or do we talk about passenger facilitation? Uh, the solution hasn't been um, resolved yet. But the thing is, you can see there's been different trends or different um, period of uh, over the, the last years regarding this uh, this market and this uh, this uh, um, players we moved from the fear and we did not come back from what happened on the beginning of the two to year 2000s to an issue of congestion and what uh, operators airports but not only airports ports and also uh, railways uh, all the infrastructure that uh, are used to carry to transport passengers have been supporting and facing over the last years an increasing of traffic with the same infrastructure that were developed and built a very long time ago for most of them and then, uh, even if this issue hasn't been completely solved yet and is still under-processed, the, the other weight or the other constraint that we are facing now as an industrial is the cost and the efficiency of the solutions that needs to be implemented. And so this is where, as a solution and technology provider, we are moving from one of these trends to the others and trying always to bring the best of our technology and the best of our solutions to our customer. Uh, I will not go through all these steps of the processes of the departure of our, uh, an arrival in an airport. You are all very well aware of all these different steps, all the different stakeholders involved of, uh, in each of them. And you know that in an airport, one of the complexity remains lies in the diverging um, objectives and goals of all these stakeholders involved in the processes regarding immigration officers, regarding 
operators uh, in the airport regarding airlines and in the middle of all that the, the passenger and a, a citizen. So what uh, was the context in Changi? Uh, you, if you've been traveling to, to Singapore, I guess there's a representative from Singapore maybe in the, in the room from the Ministry of Home Affairs or from, from the airport. Uh, Changi Airport is a huge hub in the region, in Southeast Asia, with lots of passengers arriving but lots of, and departing, but lots of passengers also transiting in the airport. Terminal 4, which will be opening uh, in, um, uh, so in less than a week, on October 31st, uh, claims to be and wants to be the showcase for Changi Airport of all the new uh, ways uh, of implementing and um, creating an airport, what it should be in, in the future. On our side, we are just contributing on a very small part, a very important part, but a small part of the global uh, terminal. Uh, but this terminal will be, and you will see all the press release and the videos in a, in a few days, will provide a completely new experience to passengers using and traveling through this, uh, this terminal. The, um, just a few figures, and these terminal processes about 60 million passengers, uh, passengers a year, just um, to give you this highlight. The, this program, which is called the FAST program, uh, one of the drivers was one of the buzzword we hear in the industry right now, which is frictionless or seamless experience. And so, how can each of the stakeholders of the terminal, uh, from the retail to uh, the security operators to the airlines, all these stakeholders can bring a value and um, give some credit to this objective of a seamless experience in the, in the airport. And on, on our side, uh, one of the key requests, because this is where we come from, was the biometrics. How can biometrics leverage on that and bring a value on not having to present and use your document or your credential at each step of your journey inside the airport? And how can we also um, integrate this process in one of the other trends of the airport, which is the self-services increase of all the usage at each step of the uh, process that was described a little bit before. One other constraint was the design, because we are part of a global scheme in the T4 pro project, and one that can um, look maybe not so important, but um, created a lot of discussion during the tendering phase and the POCs after the, the tender and uh, the workshops were the height. There was a very strict and surprising at the beginning request to have nothing over 1.4 meter in the terminal, but not only for us, for everyone, for a matter of uh, design and user and passenger experience. And so we had to adapt our technology and our solutions to match this requirement and prove that through um, the solutions and the technology that we can embed, we can match this and we can make this, make this happen. It looks uh, something um, not important, but you will see that it brings also lots of um, good, good results. So, regarding the deployment and uh, the, the stages, and what, what did we do? I will just talk about the um, departure process. We also provide an automated or automatized process for the arrivals through a kiosk, pre-enrollment, and uh, in, in, uh, in information sharing between the kiosk and the counter of the officer. Regarding the departure process, we, there are three steps. In fact, four, but you will see that the second one has been the merge of two controls in the airport. So we start from the self backdrop, then there's an uh, entry of the security area, border control, and boarding, uh, boarding process. All these processes are based on a self-service mode and pushing most and all of the uh, uh, activities that we can to the passengers, so is uh, as autonomous and as independent uh, as possible. Biometric self-enrollment as a self-backdrop. So what was the challenge at this stage? It was integrating the solution with 
another party, uh, because we are not providing uh, safe backdrop solutions, but working with uh, the safe backdrop provider that was selected by Changi, integrating in this process the biometric capture of the face and the issuance of a uh, unique ID for the passenger during his process in the airport, which is a merge of his passport information, his boarding pass, and his biometrics. So these are the different steps uh, in the, uh, at the self backdrop, from the boarding pass reading until the matching, and so the issuance of this, uh, this unique ID that will be used over the next steps in, uh, in the journey of the, of the passenger. Then we come to step two, step two, which is step two in two, two times. The first, uh, the first step two is uh, the first part of the step two, so it's the entry in the secure area, security area, or we could, well, we could call the international uh, part of the, of the airport. So then you get two situations. Either you've passed through the safe backdrop or you made your web check-in and you arrive directly without any uh, check luggage to, to the airport. What do we do? Uh, we go there directly. So what do we do? Either if you've been to the safe backdrop, you've, you go to the first gate, uh, you scan your passport, you identify with your biometrics, and we verify that you are already an, an, identi an identifier sorry, uh, through the safe backdrop, and we have a live match between the photo of in the day one, what we call photo of the day, so the photo captured at the safe backdrop, and the photo at the gate and then you can proceed to the uh, immigration gate. Maybe I will take questions a bit later, if it's okay. Ah, c'est gênant, effectivement. Il n'y a pas de traduction. Okay. Uh, ah, je serai disponible après, si vous voulez, pour parler en français après la présentation. Ok, d'accord. Désolé. Um, and so the second part of the step, uh, step two, is the, is the immigration process. So what was interesting in this, uh, in this case, uh, because you know in the airport space is money, space is gold, uh, these two processes were separated initially, and you had one uh, two-door gate and another two-door gate a little bit further in the airport. So the Changi asked us, and the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs asked us to merge these two processes into one two-step gate. So first step of the gate, the uh, control of the security area. Second step of the gate, the immigration checks. What I didn't mention is because uh, the importance of uh, acceptance in this kind of project is key, you have to identify which will be the passengers, whose passengers will be using at first this solution so you can show it's working and you can show the efficiency of the solution. And so this is why, to start, it will be Singaporean citizens only and resident permits holders. Why? Because for the immigration checks, it's a sum biometric check, so using the sums of the uh, citizens, because in Singapore, all citizens are enrolled from age six, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with their fingerprints in a national database. So you can use these biometrics to make the immigration checks. And as a resident permit, also when you get your resident permit card, you also have to provide your biometrics, and so then you become eligible to the to this solution. So this, uh, at this step two, First gate, uh, facial recognition. Second part of the gate, um, fingerprint matching versus a one-to-many check on the national database. And last, uh, last step of this process, the boarding. So boarding, you are more and more familiar, I guess, with all, uh, all of you, the self-boarding using uh, a 2D barcode and going through the boarding gates now uh, in many, many airports. Now the idea is also to merge in one control, one check, the verification of the document uh, and the verification of the boarding pass to be sure that you are the right boarding gate and you are authorized to board the plane. You've been through all the previous checks and controls in the airport. So what do we provide at this stage? The, the idea, and this is where also we think there is lots of value to governments and airport operators, and then airlines, 
is by using the face uh, that was captured previously in the process, either at the self-backdrop or at the entry of the security area, we then make a match by using the boarding pass. You, we use the index of the boarding pass to um, check and to retrieve the temporary ID that was created at this stage, at the previous stage, and we make a live matching one-to-one -one between this, this photo that was captured and the person, the passenger, at the boarding gate. And then, if it's correct, if you match, you can proceed and we integrate and we um, provide this information to the queued system so that the airlines can proceed also to this boarding of all, the, all these passengers. So always facilitation and security enhanced and managed in a separated way. So this quick video, yeah, there's no sound, and it was made a few, few months ago by um, uh, Changi Airport. You see at the different steps, what, uh, how, how does it work? So this is the form factor of the uh, face um, capture and the face recognition in the E-gates. That's why I was talking about the 1.4 meter, because the previous solutions and what you can see usually uh, in the market is more, uh, is taller, taller solutions. And when you get to the boarding gate, you just have to scan your passport, face matching, and then you proceed. So quick, secure, and I would say I like the design, but maybe I'm not very objective about that. To conclude, the challenges uh, that we had to address, I've been uh, through them uh, during this uh, presentation, so I will come back quickly on them. High challenge, so yes, surprising, but then you will see that in all the terminal, nothing high, everything small and convenient, so thinking about the passenger experience in the, in the airport, sorry. Uh, how can we use then the passport and accompany the passengers in a better usage of his, of his passport? Data privacy, uh, I didn't mention data privacy, of course, all this information are highly secure, are not stored, are temporarily created and then deleted in the system, and there is no other usage made by the authorities regarding the uh, data privacy regulation in Singapore out of the airport uh, passenger processes. And uh, this one, regarding all these stakeholders, you remember, you all know all these stakeholders that are involved in the, in the airport. You need all of them to believe and to be confident in the checks that are provided and that are managed by the, the solution and the technology. If for the efficiency, you don't have to recheck and to do what the other part of the process has been doing before. Uh, and so trust uh, each party. This is my last, my last slide. So the benefits and what we believe could be also the next steps in the next generation because this is brand new, but there is still new, new solutions and new ways to enhance what has been developed. Uh, customer relationship. By customer, I take the cap of the airport, so customer is a passenger. Uh, how can I make some more loyalty and uh, a better feeling coming back to my airport and um, um, advertising for, for the airport experience? Uh, for those that have been traveling in France, and I know there are some French people also in the room, but sometimes it can really be a nightmare for a very touristic country, uh, such as France, that traveling in uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport. Uh, less wait time, uh, so let's try to work on the stress uh, process, the stress area of uh, the passengers and make this experience stressless or not so stressful and then work on the, uh, um, uh, accompany the airport in the um, uh, expansion of its non-aeronautical uh, revenues. Uh, security of uh, the end-to-end -end process. Uh, I say all what we do is certain and for sure. And regarding the uh, future evolution, biometric payment is something that we have been already been talked about. And another thing that you may you may imagine is not having to use at all the boarding pass. It was a request from uh, Changi Airport and from the authorities to still keep the boarding pass as a credential, but in the future, your biometric will be your boarding pass. 
thank you to all and uh, we'll be at your disposal and your boss uh, idemia, idemia for, for the French one. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Christophe. It's interesting, again, to see a practical application to the technology that we've been talking about for a few years now and coming to fruition. We'll make the quick change and be right back. Sigpa, and the presenter is Laurent Lou. He is the project manager of identity security solutions at Sigpa. A few words about Laurent. He began his career as an engineer in the semiconductor industry, where he gained sound knowledge and experience in product management in telecom and high tech areas. He joined Sigpa in 2016 as a project manager. He was responsible for the product management of identity security solutions, notably the Smart Stamp machine readable solution. So, Laurent, all over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this morning about the specifically about the travel stamp. We have seen a lot of uh, uh, in, uh, improvement in the security about passport in the recent year with a different uh, security feature based on ink uh, within the pages of the passport on the personalization page and also recently with the electronic passport. But uh, one part that remained really uh, very, um, let's say, which is the weakest part today is the travel stamp. And so uh, we came up with this, uh, we're thinking, uh, how can we, uh, SIGPA, make the travel stamp evolve in the digital world? where we have all those different connectivities, all the capabilities with smartphones. And here the idea is to think about how can we make it secure. So we started by looking at the life cycle of STAMP. So there are different steps, right? So starting with a decision. Is the traveler entitled to come in my country, yes or no? Uh, depending on, so this decision done by a pre-clearance pre system or directly by the border officer. Then this decision has to be recorded. Um, so either in the document directly as a former stamp or in an entry exit system uh, that is a centralized database. And then the information has to be controlled by a lot of stakeholders. Uh, here we have the example, first starting with the traveler himself. He has to know uh, when he's entitled to, to remain within the country and um, also has to be able to show and demonstrate that he legally entered within the country. Then you have border officers that can check for uh, the validity of the, the permit and to eventually detect uh, overstayers. You may have within the country law enforcement agencies um, using so different investigation tools to be sure that the person is entitled. Uh, you can think about work inspectors, uh, also private sectors uh, like namely hotels, bank, to provide services based on these stamps. And 
last but not least, other countries uh, that are very interested also to know which routes uh, a particular passenger has taken uh, before coming within your country. So we see all those stakeholders really need uh, a reliable information uh, and are basing different risk analyses and also uh, um, uh, allowing credential to come within the country or provide services. And um, we think that this is really important to, to secure this, this element that currently is really looking like 100 years ago. So to record uh, a decision, uh, again, we take those two uh, ways that uh, are actually complementary. So one is really embedded in, directly in the, the passport itself, uh, available for different stakeholders, um, and one which is uh, digital. And both have pros and cons are really complementary. So first with the travel stamp, we all know that it's prone to copies and to frauds. Uh, you have also limited information embedded in the stamp, so mainly uh, the port of entry, the country, entry date, and that's almost it. Um, also, the stamp is made really the same for everybody, so um, there is no real personalization for each traveler or every border crossing event. On the entry access system, um, sometimes it's difficult to have the service available everywhere within your country. You have also some, some difficulties to have a data exchange even within the same country between law enforcement agencies, between uh, border uh, control, and, and to, to um, always manage the access on the right manner to exchange the information. And uh, also, um, it's, uh, it's, of course, permanent risk to, to have security breach, as we saw in the last couple of years, where we had very important systems that have been hacked. So we at SIGPAO have focused on our attention on really on this part of the, the, the travel stamp. So, and providing specific uh, answers to the, the, the three problems that we identified. So first on the, on the copy and counterfeit. So here we work like, like uh, banknotes, um, where we stack different layers of security um, and based on, let's say, material-based uh, or based on inks, and also on the digital. Um, this is where we provide signatures. Um, on the second part, with limited information, we come up with the idea of uh, printing 2D barcodes where we can embed all kind of information that is requested for the control, uh, namely MRZ information, uh, but also some, some um, data coming from, from maybe the entry to exit system. So, for example, uh, past travel history or, um, or other type of uh, information you can think about. And this is really also for us important to make it unique for every uh, single border crossing event. So here you have an example of how this uh, travel stamp may look like. So you see the same type of information that you can see today, like entry, expiry date. Um, but what is interesting here is that you see already the first security element, where you see the passport number. So it means that you have f a first visual reference to see, okay, uh, is this a copy or not? Um, and this is the first way where you see, where you have a, a security element. Then you have the 2D barcode. So this is where you will store all the information that is requested for the control. This 2D barcode could be available for all the different stakeholders, um, but can be also um, so available for the, the traveler themselves. Um, we can also embed some invisible inks, so invisible information. This we'll, we'll see here enables us to authenticate 
material based the, the, the authenticity of the stamp. And again, we, we believe that the security comes from the stacking of the different security layers. So here you see on the left side, you have the material based uh, validation simply by, by tools t telling you yes or no, is this the right ink? So it's difficult for cop copier, fraudster to make it exactly the same because the, 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 the ink will not be available so easily. On the right part, you have the digital part where you can embed digital signature and you can uh, put also the passport number. So you have a second uh, reference to the passport number and when checking, you can then really see if the, the data matrix has been just made a photocopy uh, because passport has to, has to be uh, equal to the, to the document itself. So we created a mobile app that can be used as an investigation tool when controlling people, uh, let's say with roving control within the country or in the second line or in other type of use case you, you may think of and where we can control all those different elements securely by uh, just scanning the, the 2D barcode and displaying all the information securing the, the document. In a nutshell, this is the different elements that uh, are um, present to deliver this smart stamp. So we have developed a very specific printer um, that is designed to fit in the very limited um, space of, of kiosk for the tra uh, traveler um, in, within the traveler flow. So we know that the, those kiosks are very small and so we designed specifically the printer for that and which allows also to print directly within the passports. So um, at SIGPA also we are specialists of ink for banknote, for, for uh, passport and here also so we developed specific ink for uh, this application. We have seen the different uh, readers, the validators, uh, based on smartphone technologies that are today very um, available uh, very easily. And last but not least, also we developed interfaces for the border control officers uh, to be really uh, seamless and, and um, easy to use uh, when um, uh, printing the stamp within the, the passport. So this um, ends my, my presentation. Um, so uh, again, we have seen how uh, the, the STEM could look like um, and um, what we believe is important that the stamp is secure, that uh, we have ways to authenticate this stamp and that uh, this uh, stamp is unique and available for all the different stakeholders within the country that need to access uh, this information in a secure way to provide credentials or different services. And with this, uh, I end my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention and you are welcome on our booth just here um, at the exit of the, of the room here uh, where we can provide you some demonstration, some live demonstration about this new concept. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent. And as with all of the sponsors, of course, we're invited to visit the various booths for more information and the IKEA booth on the fifth floor mezzanine. So I'm just looking at Alexandra. She's so quick that she's, but we'll give you a few, a few seconds. Okay, thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you.
Okay, we're ready for the next presentation by Vincent Gourmelin. He is ID Card Solution Manager at HID Global. Vincent has more than nine years experience in the electronic and IT industry. He started his career in the machine-to-machine -machine or industrial IoT market and is now in charge of the governmental ID card solutions at HID Global with worldwide responsibility. Overseeing the development of system solutions for national ID, driving licenses, health cards, military and police ID, and many more cards, Vincent is also responsible for the preparation of commercial offers for every government ID card project worldwide. So, Vincent, we're looking forward to a very exciting presentation. Please. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very happy to be before you this morning to make this uh, presentation. Um, so today, I, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, level one security features uh, in plastic documents. So level one means the security features that we can check without the use of any additional tools, like a UV lamp or a magnifier or forensic equipment. <coughs> so I will talk about so the level one security features, what are the evolution, uh, the threats they are facing, and the trends, the new trends, which will bring me to talk about the windows in those plastic documents. <clears throat> so when I talk about plastic documents, I include, of course, all the ID cards, but also uh, the polycarbonate data page of a passport. So just briefly about um, HID Global. Um, <clears throat> Our mission statement, which is uh, written here, is actually two things. It's first of all to create trusted identity, which is the basis of everything. And then once we have those trusted identities, how can we empower the citizens and the governments with new tools, new services? So this is really the two main things that we are thinking about every day. So HID Global is um, has more than 25 years experience in the market. Uh, we are headquartered in uh, Austin, Texas, and uh, have more than 3,400 employees worldwide. And uh, actually, I'm um, introduced as part of HID Global, but this is very recent because um, I used to be part of uh, Ardro Systems, which uh, was acquired by HID Global just a few months back. So because it's very recent, I just want to say a few words about it. Um, Ardro Systems and HID Global are serving the same market, the government identity um, sector, with their own um, unique strengths, which are very complementary. So now more than ever, HID Global is able to provide the end-to-end issue and solutions of identity documents, whether they are passports or ID cards. And um, seeing that we have different um, strengths, um, we actually share the same DNA which is to serve our long-lasting uh, government customers with uh, flexibility and adap adaptability, and, um, and uh, actually to also focus uh, very strongly on innovation. And I would be very happy, and uh, all the team uh, of HID Global present here today will be very happy to welcome you at our booth to, um, to show you those innovations. So jumping back to the topic of today, um, we can ask ourselves whether physical security features on the documents are still useful. We have now electronic documents with cheap operating system, with a lot of, uh, um, with very strong security, cryptography. Uh, we talk about ICAO PKD, and national PKD. So why do we still need physical security features on the document? Is it very, really needed? Um, so one of the answers is to see that actually the physical document is still of great interest for fraudulent um, usage. Um, we have this data potential, uh, in the world today, as of today, there are about 2.4 million US passports that are unaccounted for, either lost or stolen. Well, this is 
clearly a great um, concern, and this really shows that the physical document itself is really, really of interest and needs to be protected. Um, there's also one other statement, which is that today, plastic documents, plastic cards, so data page in passport or ID cards, um, are the most targeted by fraudsters because they bring new challenges to security. Um, they can be delaminated, they can be milled, grinded. Um, there's a lot of possible attacks on uh, plastic documents that didn't exist before when using paper. So this is also a new challenge that the industry has to cope with. So, yeah, as I explained, physical security features are still needed because um, although the electronic document verification is reliable, seamless, and do not uh, leave place for any doubt, um, they're not always used. You also have some, um, some, some uh, document scanners that are going to check the security features of the document, which is really, really great tools. But the problem is that if a, a fake document is having the real security features on them, you will have this green light effect that will tell you that the document is a genuine one when in fact it's not, it's not, it's a fake one. Um, so yes, private sectors, for example, are not equipped with this type of equipment. And today, um, I believe one of, uh, one of the challenges of identity is to be able to use it uh, for government purposes, but also for private uh, sectors. And um, you have some of the security features available on the market that are really industrially perfect, which are giving like uh, so, so, some type of uh, resolution and uh, precision to the microns that are um, extremely good. Uh, but the problem is that they can be a little bit deceptive uh, and they are not enough. I'm not saying they are not useful, but they might not be enough. And um, so clearly the manual inspection of a document prevails, so that's why the security features of a document are the key elements uh, for the, new, the, the current identity documents. So just um, to check the classic type of attacks on, uh, on, on polycarbonate document. Um, so to illustrate that, I have a, a few pictures. One of the most common attacks is actually backside grinding. So it's uh, patiently removing uh, the security elements of the cards, like the optical variable ink, the holograms, the MLI, CLI. So by removing the different layers of the, of the card and being able to reuse the security elements on a new document. There's also the re-imaging. So polycarbonate documents are usually personalized by laser. And it's possible to use a laser to, be, to add some features to a face, like to add some hairs, to add a beard. Uh, and uh, the portrait is definitely um, the, 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 the data that is the most targeted by, uh, by fraudsters. <coughs> and you can also laminate um, printed films on the document to be able to change the data. So either you use a blank uh, real document or you have um, uh, a document w on which you have been able to, uh, to hide the current data or to uh, delete them, and you can laminate a new film on them. So this is another, another threat. And one that is not illustrated here is also the milling and grinding. So you can actually mill in the plastic document and refill it with some uh, resin, uh, transparent resin that are commonly available in the market, used by dentists, for example, these kind of things. So you also have the potential threats um, brought by uh, new technologies, more and more efficient. So today, for example, the University of St. Petersburg is uh, uh, working on an inkjet printer to print holograms. So of course, you will, at this stage, not uh, achieve the same type of, uh, of uh, precision that you can have with, uh, with uh, hologram companies, clearly. Um, but, well, this is, uh, this is a tool that uh, will probably be improved in the future. We can think of 3D printing as well, which can allow to create documents that are created on a computer, so reproduce uh, documents to the, to the perfection. Some tools available uh, on the computer that uh, uh, allow to modify the image with a lot of uh, uh, precision, like uh, Adobe Illustrator. And um, which brings me to talk about the, the, the optical um, equipment, like uh, the newest camera from Canon are up to 50 megapixels. So it gives a level of precision that are actually uh, extremely high. 
and uh, the scanners of uh, Canon as well are up to 90 megapixels. So you can imagine uh, how detailed you can go into uh, reproducing a document. Um, there is also the availability of uh, laser engravers nowadays. Um, you have uh, more and more uh, manufacturers uh, from uh, uh, Far East, for example, um, that uh, are producing some uh, affordable laser engraver that can be used to uh, modify a, a document. And you also have some material, like PVC material, that can be laser engraved today and that can even uh, add some features like uh, MLI, CLI, or this type of, uh, of thing that you, we can see in, uh, in current ID documents. So, well, we have a complicated equation to solve. Um, we need to maintain features that are affordable, because when you have a passport project or even more for national ID, um, the documents, uh, there are a lot of documents, so you cannot add too much on the, the unit cost. We need to keep the security features easily and quickly ident identifiable. For example, uh, I have some, uh, some data. Um, uh, uh, border control officers have, have between eight to 12 seconds to check the genuinety of a document. It's not, uh, it's not a lot, especially considering that some data page, passport data page, can have up to 25 different security features on them. Um, so, of course, the more efficient uh, security features, uh, uh, with, uh, um, which will uh, allow to have less security features, are more than welcome. And, uh, of course, we need to fight the ever-evolving free market technologies and the different techniques for counterfeiting and uh, uh, modifying a, a document. So, I just want to briefly talk about uh, the, the standards. It's, uh, it's a driving license, uh, international driving license standard, ISO 18013. And in the Annex C, there's something very, um, very useful and very interesting. They are actually um, making some tables, to, uh, two entries table, to list the typical attack to documents, like substituting material, uh, recycling um, documents and modifying them, or using blank documents. And they put this type of attacks against um, the security features available. Um, so when we take um, the security features that are actually luxury elements, windows, and uh, we add them with personalized data protection and optical variable elements, we actually check all the boxes in those tables. So the idea is that if we have one security features that, an, that can combine all of these uh, elements, we can have the ultimate uh, security features for ID documents. So, just want to talk about the evolution of, um, of uh, security features. So first, we, we started with uh, non-personalized features, um, which are mainly taken from the banknote uh, industry, like uh, holograms, color shifting inks, tactile features. Um, they are great, they are needed. Uh, there's no, no question about that. Um, but might not be enough because they don't uh, protect the personalization, which is, again, uh, really uh, something that is at uh, threat. Um, so after we had the, the, the personalization, um, the, the security element that brings personalization. Uh, so for example, uh, hidden data into the pictures or Ghost portrait created by perforation. This is a technology called the laser puff. Uh, this type of uh, elements. And then the idea is actually to have a uh, combination of both, so strong security features with personalization. So we can see, for example, a hologram. Here, this is a German ID, uh, so ghost portrait by uh, holography. We have some um, um, uh, color shifting ink that can be uh, laser engravable and personalized. Clear window, of course, with portrait. And some newest security features that uh, are actually adding uh, watermark effect, very special visual effects, and personalization in a window. So talking about the, the window and their evolution, um, and uh, the putting that in a, in a 2D graph, uh, which uh, um, talks about the features complexity uh, against resistance to, to fraud. 
We have the holographic stripes that will go through a window. This is quite basic because it doesn't protect the personalization again. Um, we have clear and ghost portrait inside the window or combination with CLI MLI, for example. Uh, we can think of a clear window with a um, ghost portrait with decoding function. And the more advanced um, clear window and means to, uh, to personalize them, like using negative personalization, which is actually copying with um, the threat of uh, modifying the portrait by adding things with a laser. With negative personalization, you are not going to um, darken the face, the polycarbonate, to make the portrait, but you are going to shoot around the face to make the portrait appear. So with this negative personalization, you actually cannot add any element to it. You cannot add a beard or hair or glasses or mustache. And then we have some uh, more advanced security features that actually will add all of this with some more special visual effects, uh, some watermark effects, and some protection to avoid um, removing and replacing the window itself. So we believe that windows are actually, and the advanced windows are actually uh, key in uh, protecting the document from different uh, type of attack, whether they are structural, front attack or back attack. So I was talking about them uh, earlier. You have the backside uh, grinding um, protection. If you actually uh, uh, grind uh, the, the, the window, you will destroy it. Uh, the milling and filling, if you, if you mill the window, you will lose a special visual effect that uh, it can bring. Um, and uh, for example, also laminating printed films uh, of course, if you laminate printed films, you will also kill this visual uh, effect that you have on the, on, on the window. So we believe this is really a great tool to protect uh, document and to protect uh, the personalization. So yeah, we believe, uh, to answer to the questions, we believe that windows are here to stay. Um, it's a very nice add-on to a document. Uh, it's not a revolution, but it's something that proved to be extremely useful. Uh, today in the world, we have more and more documents, uh, plastic documents that are integrating a, a window of uh, different, uh, different types. And um, well, it's, uh, it's, it's also a very great tool uh, to be able to uh, check very quickly the genuinity of the document um, because of the window and its special visual effects almost impossible to reproduce and to check the personalization, whether it's a genuine one and uh, whether the, the person you have in front of you is, uh, is the right person. Um, we have one uh, recent example, actually. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a current example because uh, uh, the, the tender is still, uh, is still open. It's a Belgium ID. Uh, in the Belgium uh, ID tender, they are actually um, not only asking for a window, but asking for a window with a security element uh, added to it. Uh, so it really shows that a window is actually a, a container to add some more security to the card and to combine it with and to combine it with um, with, uh, with strong security features. So that was it for my presentation. Um, I would be very happy to uh, talk to you further, and uh, our team uh, we welcome you at uh, our booth. It's booth number 15, just outside the, the conference room. And well, thank you very much for your attention and uh, yeah, see you later, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, for a fascinating presentation. All of these presentations are very, very interesting. And in just a few moments, we'll have our next speaker. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Mike Beckmann. He is with the Mühlbauer Group in Germany. His position is that of software project manager. He's been in that position since 2011. Some of the responsibilities and activities of that position include team leader of software developers, IT security officer, and security and solution architecture consultant for e-government 
projects. In his past career, he has also developed expertise in the development of smart security systems. So, Dr. Beckman, we look forward to your presentation. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to ICAO that I uh, can use the opportunity to speak here. Um, sorry for the long title, Identification with Extended Feature Aggregation for Increased Security and Passenger Satisfaction. I promise to make this long story short to uh, be in time. We have heard my, the speech from Edema about the uh, 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 identification uh, using biometrics in um, the passport and the travel to make it hassle-free and to increase the, uh, the uh, passenger satisfaction. We will address this uh, and use this approach to, uh, uh, yeah, to elaborate a little bit more on the passenger satisfaction um, uh, from the um, passenger satisfaction perspective to, uh, to have both sides in balance, security and passenger satisfaction. But just before I step into the solution, give me a few seconds to uh, have a look at the current situation. We have some trends, um, especially in Europe, many uh, airports operate uh, at full capacity, um, probably our visitors from Europe have seen it. Uh, the potential for new airports is quite limited. We have a not so nice example in Germany. The uh, airport, the new airport of, in Berlin is now under construction for more than 10 years and still not finished. So um, it should be quite um, heavy to uh, build new airports, obviously. We have uh, more and more security checks to tackle with. Uh, they will limit the throughput additionally and um, at least not increase the uh, passenger satisfaction. Um, following the, the EATA forecast for the next 20 years, we, we have to uh, deal with a, a rising passenger volume of about, um, uh, it will do double, so uh, the situation will be even worse. So. Installing uh, automated border control solutions can be uh, a beginning, but as we have heard, space is money and it's also limited. Uh, first airports are testing smart passenger flow systems, so this definitely should be um, a good approach. Um, let's visit the uh, touch points. We have seen them already. We have this web check-in where we start our travel uh, we have a show up in the, uh, in the uh, airport area, we have a baggage drop, we have a security check, passport border control and boarding check. It's quite uh, known to all of us. We try to uh, make it more efficient. Um, let's see how we can um, uh, deal with it. So summarizing uh, the uh, current situation, we have to say, we have to state that we need to use the resources in a more efficient way and we have um, at minimum to keep the security level and I'm quite sure that security will be a more and more rising issue. Automation and passenger guidance uh, could be a solution here. Uh, let's see how we uh, uh, can manage it. The IATA, IATA uh, One ID initiative is here to mention uh, to uh, have a smart solution installed to manage uh, passenger flow, to create a hassle-free travel experience. So this is the uh, rough uh, outline I would like to, uh, to talk about. But bef before I'm talking about the technical solution, um, obviously we have to uh, uh, tackle a few uh, challenges. First of all, administrative and political challenges we have 
various stakeholders to uh, get on one table. That's why you are here. We have uh, governments, we have uh, airlines, airport, we have security, and all these parties do have different uh, interests. We have some financial responsibilities. Who has to pay for the space if somebody is doing a check? And uh, the other party is using the results. We have, of course, the um, question about uh, public and private empowerments. Uh, is a private company empowered to do some uh, uh, governmental uh, checks? Uh, how can I trust these checks? And so on. Last but not least, we have uh, different public and private interests, of course. Um, the airline, the airport has to make money. The government has to take care about uh, the citizens, so it's quite um, contradicting. Last but not least, uh, we need the passenger here in this scenario. The passenger has to cooperate. And as it's not visible at first glance, uh, we have also here to do some, let's say, some educational, uh, some training to train the passenger. So uh, how, to, uh, how to tackle this? Uh, besides these um, administrative challenges, we do have technical challenges. Technical challenges, I'm a software engineer, so I'm not afraid about technical stuff. I'm more concerned about this um, administrative things. From a technical point of view, we have some media breaks. We have this uh, boarding pass you probably know. Uh, you have it on your mobile phone, you have it as paper printed out at home, you have it as print, printed in the uh, show up um, area, you have baggage tags more and more um, discussing electronic tags, you have e passports, uh, you have normal uh, MRTs, MRTDs, paper visa, you have with visa stamps, um, some uh, travel programs, and we have to uh, put them all together. We have some environmental conditions. We have privacy regulations, of course. This is a really important um, point, especially um, in the European Union. Privacy and data protection is quite quite big point. We have airport facilities. Space is money, as we have heard. So we have to make sure that these things are tackled. Last but not least, also social factors. Um, to be taken into account. Privacy concerns of the passengers, of course. We have individual appearances, uh, especially in the, in the Arabic uh, countries. Um, it's quite difficult to perform face recognition. And you have um, to deal with special things if you uh, like to uh, identify traveling groups or families with, uh, within a and an area. Okay, so what's our proposal? Um, the solution proposal is quite easy. Um, instead of um, installing something new, we uh, suggest to uh, use the existing video, video surveillance um, techniques already installed. We uh, um, suggest to use our biometric documents, uh, what we have already to, to uh, use the e-gates, um, Edema already uh, presented, and to uh, add additional sensors to this uh, network of identification features to identify the uh, passenger. For instance, Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, Bluetooth uh, beacons, something like this. Doing so and enforcing the cooperation of the stakeholders, as I mentioned before, we can achieve some cost reduction, we can achieve um, increase of transparency, efficiency, and last but not least, and this is important for the, from the commercial point of view, new possibilities and applications like customs monitoring, passenger guidance, and direct marketing. So, um, uh, summarizing the uh, aggregation of these various features into one uh, complex identity can be a solution here. How, how does it look like um, in, uh, in our technical world? Uh, we, use, uh, we focus on the uh, um, e-passport, of course. 
It's our trust anchor where we start from. We combine it with a face recognition because we already have now this uh, image from the document. We um, uh, continue by adding boarding information, some other biometrics, some um, uh, passenger features, elect electronic devices the passenger is, is carrying, and further uh, small features. This whole um, yeah, a feature set uh, makes an identity, at least this digital identity or the digital token we, we call it, so we are able to uh, identify the passenger uh, with a, a quite a certain, to a certain level. Here, uh, the key idea is to use our competence as a service and solution provider to use these uh, different um, devices and areas and to uh, aggregate them to enhance the uh, current identity approach and to uh, create a new experience in um, passenger identification and passenger guidance. Um, you remember the touch points I showed before? So let's, let's check um, the touch points now. We have the same touch points as before. I would, uh, we don't like to uh, change the, uh, the infrastructure. However, uh, we suggest um, to have a, a web check-in where we have an, a mobile application uh, reading the document, the electronic document at home. You do a, a, face, verifi a face, face verification um, online. Our server will check is the person on the, in the document, the person in front of the camera, so you have a, a valid pre-check. With this pre-check, um, you come to the, to the uh, airport, uh, you get guided through the system. If you have luggage, you just use the automatic uh, baggage drop-off as we have seen it. And uh, you proceed to the security check. Uh, we propose to have this um, security check um, at the next. It's quite the same. Automated border control gates help you to, uh, for the immigration and um, at the final stage, the boarding is also uh, done automatically. So the, uh, um, the system here is um, aimed to guide and assist the passenger to uh, do some clearance beforehand, to do some pre-check, to have a risk analysis already done, and uh, to monitor suspect activities and to focus more on the, on the uh, important points and to have security officer in the field to uh, focus on the, on the hotspots and not to intercept the, uh, the, the normal um, passenger flow. This is really important. We do not intercept the, the flow. We just um, uh, influence the, the hotspot areas. Okay. Um, to do so, to, to have some mobile verification, we developed um, a small um, mobile app for NFC-enabled Android devices to uh, allow uh, officers um, in the field to uh, focus on suspects. Uh, the mobile verification is really um, cost-effective by reading uh, the E document, we read the, the image, we read the data on, in the chip. It's quite easy to handle. Uh, every child can use it and it's not disturbing or queuing or otherwise interrupting the, the normal passenger flow. Um, we can even perform um, waste recognition. So uh, by sending the picture to our waste recognition server, we are able to check is the person in front of me the same uh, as in the as the document holder to be sure to make it easy for the officer to decide. Mobile applications um, on the smartphone of a passenger can guide, can guide him to the gate to say, here is a special offer, where's your gate? Uh, you have to, uh, to speed up a bit and so on. And 
what is even possible combination and integration with um, automated border control solutions. So our system can announce the um, passenger at the gate, at the border uh, control to uh, do some pre-checks, to uh, have some um, uh, benefits or whatever. So it's quite a, a broad range of possibilities. Yeah, that's it. Let me summarize it a bit. Uh, I hope I'm in time. Um, with this, uh, by creating the federated digital token, we are able to uh, enable stakeholders to improve and to streamline their processes in the airport, uh, on the field. Um, it, we enable them to increase the passenger satisfaction because of the, of the guidance and the less interruptive uh, process. And uh, we allow to, an, uh, to create potential revenue. We help to achieve political consent because we have, on the one hand, we have um, instruments for increasing security, and on the other hand, for increasing passenger satisfaction and um, doing it hassle-free. We use state-of-the-art technologies for mobile verification. You have seen it. Um, uh, we just focus on monitoring uh, supervision and tracking, and we are able to incorporate additional uh, extensions or applications. Uh, I would like to invite you to visit us at our booth, uh, right here at the right corner, so you can see how the verification looks like, and we can discuss further aspects of this technology. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready for your questions now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. We are now set for the final presentation before the coffee break. It will be made by Frank Schmaltz, is the Director for Innovations and Business Development at Veridos. In that position, he is responsible for innovation management, emerging products, business development, and technical marketing. Over the past 16 years, he has been working in the GD Group government solutions business with several responsibilities, including research and development, customer projects, and project manager. He is a member of the SID ID4D working group, contributes to numerous articles to ID journals, and is a regular speaker at conference. So we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I know I'm the last presentation standing between you and the coffee break, so I will try to make it uh, brief and in time. My presentation will be about the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Project funded by the European Union, PROTECT. And the topic of the Horizon 2020 project is the future of border control in the context of the European Union, of course. And the background of it is basically, we heard it already several times today, that the International Air Transport Association made some kind of forecast and it expects 7.2 billion passengers to travel in 2035. This will be a near doubling to 2016, where we will have, um, where we had approximately 3.8 billion air travelers. And the crucial question for us is, of course, how will airports tackle this challenge, these increased travel numbers? We can imagine um, these are, of course, all um, air traffic travelers, but um, also the border control scenario will, of course, increase uh, similarity wise. So basically, there are two ways to address the challenge. Um, the first way is we are building more e-gates and we are increasing the staff. But we all know this will increase also the space that is needed. Um, space is crucial. We heard it also today uh, several times. 
It's expensive for airports and it's not easy to extend space at airports. Even if there is land available, you have to build additional buildings, you have to change your processes in the airport and this will usually decrease efficiency also. So the second way to address the problem is basically speed up the whole process, the border control process. If you're looking at the speed up, um, we are looking at current e-gates. They are pretty much at their limits. We will look at that later on um, in speed. So basically we will need some new approaches to the border control process and the identification of the travelers. So this has also been uh, recognized by the European Commission and some representatives developed some vision and said basically in 10 to 20 years we want border crossing without any gates anymore. It has to be fluent, it has to be different. And for that, a call in the Horizon 2020 program was made, um, a, a call for a research and innovation program. And this call had several targets. One was to increase the processes, the process speed, more fluent processes. There was also um, the ask, um, the, the call for the um, research in new biometric features, what new biometric features could be used to speed up the process, to make it easier, more convenient. Also, we had to look at um, existing biometric features, how they can be improved. And the third, also very important topic was um, to embrace the ethical, societal and data protection aspects that are very um, honored in the European Union. So we have, will also have to look into legal aspects and ethical aspects during the project. So um, this is how the PROTECT project was born. So there were more than 100 applications to it. Um, and luckily we did get uh, the project together with um, other nine partners from six countries. We have uh, two end users also in our consortium, the British Border Guard and um, the Polish Border Guard, UK Home Office and Polish Border Guard. And since this is a research and innovation project, of course, most of our partners are university and research institutes like the University of Reading, University of Salzburg, and for the legal and ethical aspects, the University of Unamur is one of our partners. So one aspect that we will have, have to research is the exploitation of new biometric modalities and existing ones. This will be a topic mostly for the research institute and the universities. They will look at new biometric features like anthropometrics, 2D phase, 3D phase, so 2D phase in the near infrared area, thermal phase, pericular, which is just the area of the eyes, um, iris recognition, of course, finger vein, voice and hand vein recognition. For um, the University of Unamur, they will research in the legal and ethical aspects, and Veridos will research how the overall process of the border control scenario can be improved, together with these advancements in the certain biometric features. So in the product project, we will focus basically on two scenarios. One scenario is the ARC border, where we have uh, walking passengers um, individually crossing the border. And the second scenario will be um, the land border, where we'll have usually people sitting in cars approaching the border, and they will usually also have to be checked inside the cars, and buses. First, let's have a look at the ARZ border scenario. Um, or, and uh, in addition, we will also make two demonstrators, um, one for the ARZ border scenario, and also one for the land border scenario. So if you look at the ARZ border scenario, and if you look at the current approach in the European Union that we are making there, we use e-gates there to improve the speed. And if we are looking at the processes in um, going through an e-gate, we can analyze the time that is used for several steps. So usually the first step is reading out the travel document, which takes around five to six seven seconds. Then we are verifying the document. It's pretty fast, almost no time. Background checks are also very quick. Face recognition around a second maybe. And then the last point again, uh, gate mechanics, so the boarding of the passenger in, in, the, in the gate and leaving it again, opening the doors, closing the doors, setting back the system, it takes up to 10 seconds basically. So this is on the majority basically of time that we are using, reading out the document and the gate mechanics. In addition, this uh, timing is basically ideal. So if the passenger, the traveler, is not making any mistake, and with the reading of the document, we're having a lot of issues. 
because um, people are not used to put the passport on the reader. Mistakes are made, basically slowing down everything even further. If we now try to improve um, this process, we also have to take into account the legal and ethical constraints inside the European Union, of course. And um, the European Union just um, um, released a new law, the General Data Protection Regulation, which will come into effect in May 2018 in every member state. And this uh, new regulation also imposes certain limitations to the use of biometrics. So um, basically, um, uh, storage limitations and uh, purpose limitations and data minimizations are factors that will affect basically also our pro um, project and the possibilities how we can speed up things there. Let me give you an example. So there has been um, an attempt in 2013 to introduce a registered traveler program in the European Union. This registered traveler program was for foreign citizens like business travelers, frequent travelers that wanted to get into the Schengen area. And the proposal uh, stated that they wanted to build up a huge biometric database inside the European Union for these additional travelers and do then uh, facial recognition and fingerprint recognition at the border for these uh, travelers. Um, the program would have been voluntarily, so it's not that the people would have been forced for it. Anyway, when it came to the discussion with the European Parliament, um, there were great objections again another, against another central biometric database. Basically, um, the um, European Parliament had doubts that uh, the security of this database can be um, granted and uh, there is danger basically of identity theft and misuse of this data. So basically, this RTP proposal failed in 2013. There's another example, that's uh, the Nizza Airport, frequent traveler system. There, um, the biometric modalities have been stored on a chip card, so it, there was no central database. It was also just for convenient purposes, so it, there was no difference to the LTP program, but since the biometric data has not been stored in a central database, this proposal has been accepted by the data protection officers. So for us, for us as a the project, protect project, as a conclusion, we said, okay, we will have to focus basically on solutions that are not requiring a large central biometric database to speed up things. So um, with uh, the reduction of reading time, we are focusing on new transmission methods and the use of mobile devices. And with the removal of mechanics, uh, we were I'm considering basically a tunnel scenario where people are just walking through and we have recognition on the move. So no moving parts anymore to speed up these processes. Of course, with the new setup, new challenges come. So if people are moving, the recognition accuracy will go down. Uh, we will have suddenly one-to-many biometric matching, usually in an e-gate. You know exactly against which template you have to match. If you just let people walk by, you have ever, all, all the time several templates you have to match again. And you also have the problem that passengers might not look into the sensor. For the reduced recognition accuracy, we are looking for biometric multimodal fusion. So we are not only taking the face, we are also doing, taking additional biometric features and then fusing them together in a fusion module and getting a higher accuracy from that. The one-to-many biometric matching, um, if the process is done right, we can keep it to only a few people, maybe less than 10, so this will be not a big problem. And the topic with the passengers, uh, not looking into the sensors, this will be basically um, information topic and, and uh, signaling, and also we can assume that passengers will want to pass through the border fast and unhindered, and if they know that if they don't look into the sensors, they will grab out afterwards and uh, have to do a manual check, they will probably cooperate in that area. So if we want to use additional biometrics in the current systems, we have the issue that the current passports are usually issued for 10 years and um, they are closed up, so you cannot add additional biometrics to them. And that would, of course, limit the introduction um, of such new systems, so we will have to go for a different approach. And the idea is basically to have uh, kiosks at the departure airports where you can enroll these additional biometrics. 
And then this additional data is stored either in the mobile phones of the traveler or in um, new enhanced um, machine-readable travel documents. The ICAO just, is just working on a new logical data structure too, which will allow the adding of biometric features in the field. So you can basically go to a kiosk and take a new biometric feature and feed it to the passport. Now, if you're looking at the verification scenario, if you are using really a document, then you would first have to go to a kiosk, additional biometrics are read out, and the existing biometrics, and then you're just passing through the corridor, biometric recognition is done, and after a successful biometric recognition, the data is erased, and if there's a problem, the border control officer basically will see, okay, the person that is just leaving the corridor had some identification issues, so he will take him to a second line of control. Biometric data is erased after leaving the corridor, so no central large biometric database is created. The whole speed of the process could even be um, increased if we are using mobile devices, because then we can, are able basically to transfer this data while walking towards the corridor. So we have some kind of um, Wi-Fi connection to the system. The data is transferred just before passing through the door corridor. The passenger does not have to stop, he's just walking through the corridor, comparison is done. And then again, uh, the border control officer, officer can check if this has been successful and data is erased again after this has been successful. This scenario, of course, would require an interface, a Wi-Fi interface in the border control systems, and we know um, that many countries will be very reluctant to do that because it's, of course, a challenge in IT security if you want to, if you have an open um, interface here. So this has to be taken care of that um, good IT security measurements are there. But we have seen also countries who are already doing things like that. The land border scenario is a little bit different. Here you have the passengers in or on vehicles with new, here we want to use new biometrics, uh, coming back to the later. The challenges are also a little bit different. In the land border scenario, you don't have a closed up space. Um, these are open spaces at the control posts, so you have harsh environmental conditions. In the summer, it's very hot. In the winter, it's very cold. The sun is blinding sensors that you might have mounted there. Um, usually, it's required that the passengers stay in the car during um, the check. And the border guards currently are pretty exposed because when they are approaching a vehicle, basically, they don't know um, who is sitting in there and uh, if this is a dangerous situation or not. Again, in the introduction of mobile devices can improve this. So if uh, data is transferred beforehand to the border control officer, um, he can already verify who is sitting in the car, who to expect, and we intend to try here new biometric modalities like finger vein and hand vein recognition, because from our experience from our last um, Horizon 2020 project, where the FastPass project where we used mobile uh, where we used um, cameras to do face recognition. We had the experience that um, the sun was blinding the lenses and uh, from strong winds, vibration blurred the images. So we expect that the contactless hand vein recognition system could be more applicable here. After the border control officer has seen that um, the data has been arrived and biometric, automatic biometric verification has been done, he can make a quick check, basically, that there are not additional people in the car, and then um, we are done. So, to sum up things, the PROTECT um, project will develop um, new methods of checking um, border checking. We will research new biometrics and multi-biometric fusion. We will research how we can use mobile devices to store um, biometric and biographic information for the border control process. We will also look into improving existing machine-readable travel documents, and we will build uh, two demonstration sites, uh, one with the UK Home Office and one with the Polish Border Guard, to tr demonstrate our fancy, uh, findings in the next years. Thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions, yeah, please feel free to ask. And visit us at our booth, of course. We are just directly across um, the uh, entrance here, booth 11 and 12. You have a fan out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Frank. And thank you to all of the speakers this morning. And thank you, all of you, for having been here this morning, quite an early, most of you. If you've missed the announcement this morning, the new ICAO trip magazine is out. It's at the back of the hall. We invite you to take a copy or two as you leave. We're now ready for the coffee break, sponsored by OVD Kinogram. And let's make it back here at 11 o'clock to give our other presenters the full time allotted for their presentations. Thank you. Enjoy the networking activity. <laughs>